Hi, everybody. My name is Jim Hopper. I'm the executive director of Bainbridge Community Foundation. Um, if you don't know Bainbridge Community Foundation, uh, we are a small community foundation located in Bainbridge Island, Washington, just about eight miles uh, across the water from Seattle. Um, and you might ask, what is a community foundation um, doing with some of these nationally recognized speakers? Well, we have Paul Merriman to thank for that. I will get to Paul's introduction in just a moment, but I'll tell you that one of the things that we appreciate so much about Paul is the um, the vision that not everyone should, or that, that everyone, excuse me, should uh, have access to good quality financial education, not just those that are wealthy. And um, so it's a core belief of ours and um, something that, that we believe very strongly. All of you, wherever you are, will have community foundations that are doing work in your area. So I encourage you to look them up and find out a little bit more about what they're doing to improve your community. So now getting to Paul. Um, so Paul Merriman is a nationally recognized authority on mutual funds, index investing and asset allocation. Um, you will know him from his many presentations, uh, blogs, podcasts, market watch articles, um, and of course, his website, paulmerriman.com, where he has um, a ton of resources available to folks. Um, after retiring in 2012, Paul started a, a service mission to uh, ensure just what I was mentioning before, that financial education is in the hands of everyone who needs it, not just those that are wealthy. And um, through his Merriman Financial Education Foundation, he has created countless um, resources for, for folks. And one of his um, sort of shining uh, accomplishments most recently is the establishment of the Merriman Financial Literacy Program at Western Washington University, which is Paul's alma mater. Um, that is ensuring that every student will receive um, financial education. And not only that, but that the programs are going to be available to um, folks in the community as well. So we are tremendously honored. Paul is a, is a past trustee of the Bainbridge Community Foundation, and um, we just love the guy. So it's always delightful to be able to sit down with him, and we're excited to um, hear more about the conversation with Stan and Paul. Um, just so that you know, if you have any questions, there is a Q&A button down at the bottom of the, um, of the, bottom of the, of the ribbon. And you can ask those questions there. Um, we will have a Q&A period at the end of, of the session. We'll do our best to get to them. Some, sometimes people ask really specific questions that we may not be able to get to, but um, we will do our best. So with that, I will turn it over to you with my appreciation, Paul. Thank you, Jim. And I certainly appreciate uh, the great work that the Bainbridge Community Foundation uh, does uh, in our community. It is amazing. Well, I am, I am truly excited now, I say truly excited because uh, the person I'm about to introduce you to, every time I watch him on a video or listen to a podcast, uh, he always gets me excited <laughs> because he's a man filled with certainly more energy uh, than, uh, th than most of us have. And I just think his work is so powerful. We on our website have a list of what we call truth tellers. And uh, Stan is on that list of truth tellers. Uh, while his name is Stan Hathcock, what we know him on in the world is as Stan the Annuity Man. And I don't know anybody who knows more about annuities than Stan. He's written about them. He's done a, a thousand videos. He's, uh, he is a, an amazing educator. Uh, in this particular arena. And he also, by the way, has a, a long background in, in the investment community as well as writing uh, at Market Watch and writing at uh, The Balance. And by the way, The Balance is one of my favorite, my uh, uh, favorite websites for, for investors. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, Stan is here today and we want to learn about annuities. And I know nobody better prepared and more willing to talk about this. And by the way, we talked about uh, for a few minutes, uh, Jim and Stan and I talked about this presentation. This is not an insurance sales pitch. This is a, is a series of facts about the process of investing or 
not exactly as you'll find out. It may not be about investing, but putting your money into an annuity. And Stan, welcome. We really I'm, appreciate it. I'm so glad to be here, Paul. It's an honor, and I welcome everyone out there. I want to tell everyone, you know, you say, okay, you're going to talk about annuities, and you automatically have your fist up. I want you to put them down. This isn't a sales pitch. We're not going to talk about a specific carrier or product. We're going to talk about the category, okay? My background, just a little bit, I was with Dean Witter, Payne Weber, Morgan Stanley, and UBS on the investment side, did that for a very long time, and then decided to come out into the annuity space. I know that's, you're going, why would you ever do that? The reason I did that is because it needed a factual voice out here, someone screaming into the hurricane of sales pitches to give the facts about annuities. Now, the fortunate part about that is that very basic strategy that my grandfather told me all the time, hey, Stan, if you tell the truth, you don't have to remember anything. That is really our business model. And it really coincides and correlates with the annuity industry because annuities, plural, are contracts. Okay, My company is called The Annuity Man. Uh, the annuity man.com you you will be able to go there and no one's going to bug you you can run quotes on our proprietary calculators 24 7 365 i've written seven books which you can get for free and i've done a thousand videos that are edu edutainment educational and entertainment that are not sales pitches they're facts and i tell the good and the bad of these products and every single annuity type has a benefit and a limitation list which we will go over but that's my background i'm passionate about this um, a lot of people in the industry do not like me because I am um, the truth venom for a lot of the sales pitches that are out there. And we'll talk about that. Um, but annuities might not be for you. Let's go there initially. And then I'm going to have Paul ask me some questions. But just to understand this, if you come to this a little jaded, I hate all annuities. I don't like all annuities. You already own two and maybe three. And let me explain that. You already own the best inflation annuity on the planet. And that is called Social Security. That's a pension type payment that increases with inflation. It's not an actuarial thing that they calculate. It's political. If you have a pension from your company or you work for the government or state or a good labor union, you have a pension. That is an annuity type payment. Um, and then I actually look at required minimum distributions from your IRA as part of your income floor because that's somewhat of an annuity payment that's got to happen every year whether you want it or not. Those are those are income annuities. There's many different types, but I want to let you know that you already own them. You might you might not like them, or you might not like how they're sold, but you already own annuities, and most people really like their Social Security pension type payments. So with that, I'm going to throw it back to Paul and have him ask some questions. Well, let's just dig into what an annuity is, Stan, and I I I know it's a whole bunch of things, but. What What is the most important thing about an annuity? Well, an annuity is a contract. Um, it's You're going to get a policy in the mail if you buy it. It's a contract. And because of that, you should buy it solely for the contractual guarantees. That statement right there drives the industry crazy, but I'm right. You never buy it for what it might do. You always buy an annuity for what it will do. Now, I have an easy couple of ways to determine whether you need an annuity. You might not. But the acronym that I use for what the goal solve for is PIL. P stands for principal protection. I stands for income for life. L stands for legacy, giving money away if you don't qualify for life insurance or you need something in addition. And the other L stands for long-term care. So principal protection, income for life, legacy, and long-term care. If you don't need to solve contractually for one or more of those goals and transfer the risk to the annuity carrier to solve for that, then you do not need an annuity. You do not need an annuity if you're trying to get market growth, market upside, all those great sales pitches that you're hearing. You don't buy an annuity for upfront bonus. I call that candy for the stupid. There's not a philanthropist at an annuity company that wakes up in the morning and wants to give money away. The other thing that I use, two questions. What do you want the money to contractually do? And when do you want those contractual guarantees to start? I'll give you an example. You might say, I need, me and the wife need, or me and the spouse need lifetime income, we need it to start immediately, or we need it to start in five years. Or you might say, we don't need income, we need principal protection, and we need that principal protection to start now because there is an annuity type that is just like a CD, and it's the annuity industry version of a CD called a multi-year guarantee annuity. One thing that you need to understand, even though um, annuities were put on the planet during the Roman times, annua, meaning payment, that's the original immediate annuity, and that's been sold 
That version has been sold in this country for hundreds of years. And the primary solution most people think about with annuities is lifetime income. And that is a great way to do lifetime income because there's no ROI until you die. You can structure it so that as long as you're breathing or as long as one of you or the spouse is breathing, it's going to pay. And we can then contractually structure it so that if you die early in the contract, 100% of any unused money goes to the beneficiaries. But it really comes down to that PILL acronym, Principal Protection, Income for Life, Legacy, and Long-Term Care. Depending on how you count, there's seven to 10 different types of annuities, and that's including charitable gift annuities, which we can talk about as well. Um, but that's kind of the oversight of the industry. But you really need to break down. Don't say, yeah, I'm thinking about annuity. Think, Say, what am I trying to solve for? Do I need more income floor? Do I need to protect principal? Do I need legacy? Or do I need to look at an enhancement for long-term care or an additional coverage that you might already have in place and you want something additional? It's really, really that simple. Well, Stan, I can tell you from doing hundreds of workshops where I addressed uh, retirees that the greatest luxury, financial luxury they had was a pension. Mm-hmm. And I'll bet you that there are a number of people with us here tonight that that don't realize you can, in essence, buy a pension and and give us the steps. What what does sure. it take to be able to buy a pension or an annuity? Well, at my site, there's four calculators for four different products that solve for lifetime income. Those four products are single premium immediate annuities. That's the grandfather. That's when you need income to start between 30 days and a year. OK, then there's deferred income annuities, which is an immediate annuity that you defer. So once you go past that year deferral, that's a deferred income annuity. Now, there's a sister product of that called a qualified longevity annuity contract that's used inside of an IRA that once again is a pension product. And all of those products I just mentioned, immediate annuities, deferred income annuities and QLAX, there's no moving parts, no annual fees, no market attachments. There's straight transfer of risk that's primarily priced on your life expectancy or life expectancies, if it's joint, at the time you start the payment and interest rates play a secondary role. So the payment is a combination of return of principal plus interest. The value proposition is if you get to zero, let's say you outlive your projected life expectancy and your account has been drawn down to zero, the annuity company is on the hook contractually to pay and they will as long as you're breathing and or on a ventilator. And truly, that's the value proposition of a lifetime income stream. You can't say, you know, I, I hear pundits out there say, well, you'll do better in ETS or mutual funds. Of course, we're talking about apples and oranges. These are pensions and annuities for lifetime income are the only product that will pay as long as you are breathing. There's no ROI until you die. You can also structure these for a period certain. Let's just say you want to, you have, you're 60 and you need 10 years of income till you get to 70 to turn on Social Security. A lot of you are out there nodding your head. You can buy what's called a period certain immediate annuity that pays for that 10 year or seven year, or whatever. What I want you to put in your head is this annuities are customizable. So, you know, we're going to ask you these questions. What do you want the money to contractually do? When do you want those contractual guarantees to start? And then from there, we're going to say, okay, tell me about how you want to structure it. Is it life only? Is it joint life only? Do you want to make sure that a 100% of the money that you don't use if you both die goes to the beneficiaries? Do you want to use an IRA? Do you want to use non-IRA money? Do you want to use Roth IRA money? And you can use all three of those. The contractual guarantees are what you're buying. Those three types of accounts determine the taxation of the money coming out, but it doesn't affect the contractual guarantee. So Stan, when I this afternoon went to your calculator. Mm -hmm. And uh, I what I'm expecting to find out is if I give $100,000 mm -hmm. uh, under contract with an insurance company, what I will get out of there at my age 80. And uh, I, you spit out immediately a list of companies and how much mm -hmm. they'll pay out. Mm -hmm. And I noticed at the top of the list was a company that would pay me over $1,000 a month, which which at age 80 is sounding like a pretty good deal if I can live to be 100. If I live to be 81, then it's not going to be such a good deal. But but in the meantime, 
that's that's a big payoff. And the reason it's a big payoff is because I'm old and I don't have long to live. On the other hand, mm -hmm. look on down the list because there's not just the, the highest. You go, you go all the way down to the lowest. Right. And I think the lowest paid about $750 a month. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, how can one company be paying a, a thousand? And by the way, if it is easy to find out who that company is, why doesn't every insurance agent sell that product? I'm just curious about that. But well, explain yeah, the let's difference. Talk about that. Let's, let's talk about the pricing of that. First of all, annuities are commodity products. And when we strip them down the contractual guarantees, we can then shop all carriers for the highest contractual guarantee for your specific situation. You know, I, I'm licensed in all 50 states. Our main office is in Las Vegas, Nevada. We have an office in Florida, which I'm at right now. But what we do is we represent pretty much every single carrier out there. Why is that important? One thing Paul brought up is, you know, there's this, the, the, the company at the top had a really high number. And then there's one at the bottom had a really low number. Think about these annuity companies when they're issuing these, these um, lifetime income streams. They're filling tranches. Just like you build a portfolio, you have small cap, mid cap, international value as part of the overall contract, you know, all the allocation. An annuity company, and by the way, life insurance companies issue annuities, they have tranches of age ranges. And once they fill that age range with a specific premium number that their actuaries have told them that they can hit, once they hit that number, they lower the guarantee and payout not to attract you. So I always tell people, when you quote things on my site, think of a gallon of milk. A gallon of milk expires every seven to 10 days. Annuity quotes every seven to 10 days kind of turn over and you have to, you know, you can lock them in with us. But if you come back a, a month from now, you're going to probably see different carriers because they filled that tranche with your age range. That's the reason it's very, very important for, I think, the industry to represent all carriers not have any type of arrangement with these carriers, just quote them for the contractual guarantees because they are commoditized to where right now, the company that finished at the top wants Paul. Two weeks from now, I'll guarantee you they're not gonna be at the top. Now for lifetime income, I do have a kind of a, a rule. I'd like for you to look at A plus or better carriers because you're marrying that company for life and they have to be able to back up that claim. Um, so that's kind of a, you'll see ratings within, we and we represent all companies. I typically don't talk about names because it doesn't matter. <laughs> we're buying the contractual guarantees. We're buying good rated companies. But from the standpoint of how you quote it, when you go to our site and you run an immediate annuity quote or deferred income annuity quote, we're going to show you life only and joint life only. If you put that in, we're going to show life with cash refund. We'll show you a period certain. So you can do the comparison and you can see how they're pricing it. I want you to think of it like this, on an annuity payment and the one you already own, does Social Security pay more at age 65 or does it pay more at 70? Of course, it pays more at 70 because you have less life expectancy, which means there's, there's fewer um, pro projected payments, which means those payments will be higher. Does that mean you wait till 70 or you wait to buy an annuity? First of all, you can't time it. You know, the, there's no, <laughs> you just can't do it. You have to literally factor in the, the payments that you're missing, okay, while you're waiting and how long it's going to take to make that up. You probably have already done that with Social Security. But when you're talking about lifetime income payments, it's the same thing. Does it make sense for you to wait? You know, what type of account are you going to use? Is it is it your life? Is it joint life? Is it period certain? Those are the weeds that we can get into after you go to my site, re, you know, run the quotes yourself. If you want to go to the next step, you then can schedule a call and we will walk you through what all of that means. But it's pretty intuitive when you break it down to those contractual guarantees. So, so the insurance company is, is really important. Then, like you say, you want to go with A plus or, or A double plus, what, which A plus. For, for me, um, I just have a rule. There's A plus and A double plus it, for lifetime income. If you're if you're buying a lifetime income product for as long as you're breathing, I'm I'm going to encourage you to go A plus or better. Okay. So companies that are not, why are the salespeople selling those products if those products represent a a a a risk that we would not want them to take? 
Well, I'm not sure it's risky. It's just, you know, I'm just a, an old country boy from North Carolina that grew up with nothing. So I kind of, I've had this, this protection thing with my clients that I really try to make good decisions. I think a lot of times with agents, most agents sell within a 30 mile radius of where they live. They get, they get licensed with a couple of carriers. We just, I just look at it differently. I, I want to get quotes from everybody and then I want to filter it and then we'll choose with those carriers. Another thing that Paul mentioned was, you know, okay, you're getting a thousand dollars on a hundred thousand dollars, which is a 12% return, but it's really not what I want to make sure. And you know, this it's not yield. What that number is, that percentage number is an actuarial reflection in a numerical form of your life expectancy. That's all it is. And what you're saying to the life insurance company that's issuing this annuity is, is here's my money and and I'm going to structure it so that if I die, 100% of any unused money goes to my beneficiaries. But boy, if I live, you're on the hook to pay. And I have thousands, 5,000 plus clients, I bet, that the account's down to zero. They've outlived their life expectancy and they're still getting paid. Now, the taxation of that income, whether it's non-qualified IRA or Roth IRA, we can get into. But I think it's, you know, people say, are annuities a good deal, Stan? And I always go, well, tell me when you're going to die if you're getting lifetime income, you know, and I'll tell you. And even if you die early, we can structure it so that evil annuity company won't keep a penny, even though they're on, on the hook contractually to pay as long as you're breathing. So tell us about how does the annuity that would be the immediate annuity in a taxable account, how does that differ from what would happen inside of an IRA? Let's look at all three. First of all, Roth is, you know, if you want to use Roth IRA money, typically I don't advise that, but you can. I actually think that Roth is where your market growth should be because that's where you should take the market risk, my opinion. But if you say, Stan, I don't want to do that, then lifetime income is going to be tax free. Now, if you use IRA money, that's obviously been deferring taxes. You're buying the contractual guarantees inside of the IRA. So that money coming out just the uh, income amount is going to be taxed at ordinary income levels, okay? A lot of people have this thing in their head, never buy an annuity inside of the, an IRA. I would say 80% of all annuities are purchased inside of an IRA for the contractual guarantee and the lifetime income stream that people want or principal protection. But if you're using non-IRA assets, it's what you will get what's called the exclusion ratio. If you remember what I said earlier, the income stream is a combination of return of principal plus interest, okay? And if you run a non-qualified quote on my site, you'll see us strip that out and you're only going to pay taxes on the interest portion of that, of that income stream if you're using non-IRA money. So the question you gotta be saying is, wait a minute, Stan, what happens if I draw it down to zero and I live forever? Once the, once the, um, uh, the account has zero in it, then you're going to pay taxes on that full amount. But who cares? You're in the annuity company's pocket, right? But up until that point, there's an exclusion ratio and it is tax favorable um, for you to look at that. And even if you have another annuity that you want to transfer into, say, an immediate annuity, that's called a 1035 IRS exchange, which is a non-taxable event, that cost basis will transfer. But that taxation liability will be lengthened out over your life expectancy. So there's some legal strategies that we can do to really limit the taxation, but put that what I call income floor in place. Income floor is social security, pension, RMDs, dividend income, rental income, and then the annuity to fill the gap. Paul and I were talking before we went on the air. One of the things I'm, I'm proud of is you go to our site, you can run quotes two ways. You can say, okay, like Paul did, I put, I'm going to put in $100,000. How much will $100,000 generate contractually? You can also go the other way, reverse engineer and say, you know what, Stan? Me and the wife need an additional $500. So you can put in solve for $500 and then use the least amount of money contractually to solve for that goal. And in my opinion, that's the way to combat inflation. You don't buy products that have the hope and the dream of addressing inflation because they don't exist except in a sales pitch, you fill that gap by reverse engineering the quote when you need that gap filled, period. Because if you buy an annuity with what's called a cost of living increase, and you can get that in, uh, contractually, in other words, it could increase by 3% before you get excited, calm down, annuity companies have the big buildings for a reason, all they're going to do is lower that payment 
by 30 to 40% to make up for that increase. In my opinion, you're better off not doing that and just filling the gap by reverse engineering the quote when that income floor needs more money, if that makes sense. Yes, and, and I know we have people who are, for one reason or another, worried about the, the fact that we're relying on an insurance company to, mm -hmm. to fulfill this obligation. I know it's illegal for salespeople to mention the fact that there uh, are, and maybe I'm misstating that, but to mention there are that the states have uh, uh, funds to, to insure up to a certain amount. Can you, as a teacher, yes. and as a salesman, explain what that's about and how it works? Let, let's talk about this, and let me frame it um, very bluntly from the start. The coverage for annuities is not FDIC. FDIC is the best coverage you can get because F stands for federal, okay? But annuities and fixed annuities, which is what we're talking about, are regulated at the state level. Each state has what's called a state guarantee fund. Now, now that Paul brought it up, I can talk about it. That backs up these policies to a certain level. They're all different. If you want to go look, the uh, the site is nolhga.com, nolhga.com. You can pull up your, site, your state. You can look at the coverage. But in my opinion, if you're A plus or better, that's like wearing belt and suspenders. You know, your uncle that came to the family reunion wearing the belt and suspenders. It's great to have it. It's If it makes you feel better and to sleep at night. But if you're A plus or better for lifetime income annuities, you're going to be fine. The other thing that happens within the annuity industry that I have found fascinating since I've start, gotten in this a while back is what I call the annuity mafia. And what the annuity mafia is to me are the carriers that the big carriers oversee all of the carriers. You'll see a lot of consolidation and purchasing of other companies. Why? Because annuities, regardless of type, are confidence products. And the big companies are not going to allow a small company to ruin the confidence of the consumer. Because in essence, you're transferring risk to the company. You are you have confidence in them to back up that claim and pay you, you know, the guarantee that you're looking for, whether it's principal protection, income for life, legacy, or long-term care. So that the industry is very aware of that. And because there's 13,000 baby boomers hitting 65 every day, it's a yeah. demographic tidal wave of money in motion. The industry takes that very serious. The National Association of Insurance Commissioners do a great job of overseeing these carriers, making sure they're complying, making sure that the numbers make sense because we're talking about retirement, we're talking about the public. So they take it seriously. Um, I just, you know, there's a lot of a lot of the people out there selling it um, aren't taking it as seriously as I would like like for them to. So let me just ask one more thing about the state funds. Uh huh. Uh, Let's say the state has a, a maximum of two hundred and fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. I think some do. Uh, first question I have is, if that insurance company doesn't make it, will they pay the same amount that the insurance company was paying, or is it adjusted to some other factor? I've only seen it happen. The for, I've seen one case of it in two thousand and eight, um, and the the state guarantee fund they backed up the claims and the contractual guarantees that were in place. Now, two months later, a big company came in and bought it and, and backed up the claims, period. But with the state guarantee fund, again, nolhga.com, each state is different. Some states have a 250 limit. Some states have 100. Some states have 300. Some states will say it's 250 per company per owner. Some states say it's 250 cumulative. So you have to look at it. Um, if it's very important to you. But once again, if you're buying quality carriers, um, and people always ask me, hey, Stan, what happens if a double A plus carrier goes out of business? And my comment is, you know, we're all in the grocery store fighting for bread. I mean, you know, these are huge companies. I know you're saying, Stan, uh, you know, they're too big to fail. Yeah, here's the thing about fixed annuity companies that you need to understand as compared to banks that make them better than banks. But by law, they have to have 100% of your money on hand day one, period. Now, that's different than a bank that has to have, I don't know what the ratio is, 94% they can loan out and have 6% on hand. They are hand, they're not smarter than banks, in my opinion. And I've worked for big banks. They're just more handcuffed. Okay. Yeah. They, yeah. They're not allowed to do stupid things. And and they don't because of the those handcuffs that have been put in place. 
So I think we spent about a half an hour talking about what may be the most co common use of the annuity. I don't know if that's true. But, uh, but the another product that I just think many people will will be, find interesting is the MIGA. Yeah. Uh, the, that is, if you're a CD investor, yes. uh, I think people ought to at least know about the MIGA product. And uh, why don't you educate us on that, Stan? Yeah, let's talk about that. You know, there's 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 places to put your money for true safety, you know, money market CDs, AAA, AAA munis, treasuries. And then I also add to those four, I'll add MIGAs, multi-year guarantee annuities. They're the annuity industry version of a CD. Now, we love CDs. We don't sell them. And the rule that I have is if your time horizon is less than three years, you should be buying CDs. Once you go past the three-year mark, MIGAs historically provide a higher contractual yield than CDs. Now, in a non-IRA account, CDs, you have to pay taxes on the interest every year. With MIGAs, you can have it grow and compound tax deferred. Doesn't make it better than CDs, but it is something unique for those of you out there that would like to have a guaranteed interest rate, but don't want to pay the taxes on that interest, just want to kind of kick the tax can down the road whenever you want, you know, and you can pull it out when you want. Now, when you pull out the money, it comes in um, last in, first out at ordinary income levels, but you can just keep rolling it and rolling it and rolling it. And you can buy it in IRAs, you can buy it in, in, in Roth IRAs and non-IRAs, but the non-IRA money is attractive to people that have a CD portfolio, but really want to lock in good rates. And at the time of this taping, you know, we're at 20 year highs on rates. And, you know, if you there's some people out there that should probably be asking the question, wait a minute, Stan, why do MIGAs have a higher contractual yield than CDs? It's because they, remember, life insurance companies issue annuities, so they have many things that they can price it off of. The most profitable products for life insurance companies is life insurance and mm -hmm. lifetime income products because they know when we're going to die. That's the reason they have the big buildings and the PNC companies, you know, they don't know when the hurricane's going to hit. And then they have legacy bond portfolios. They they glance at the Fed, but at the end of the day, um, my, that's how they can price MIGAs to be a, a profitable product for them. Because when you see, let's just choose, you can get 6% on a MIGA right now on, on a specific duration. What that means to me is that the comp I know the company with, with you know corporate type paper that mean you can't buy they can get six and a half. They're going to keep 50 basis points and give you six. That's the way it's, that's the way the game's played. And the MIGAs, you can, you can choose them to where you can take the interest out monthly. You can choose them to where you just let it ride and compound. Some of them have a 10%, you know, penalty free withdrawal provision. Once again, they're not all the same from the standpoint of the whistles and the bells attached, but the contractual structure you're going to like it because it's going to be a CD, non-correlated asset, no market attachments, no bonuses. It's a yield for a specific period of time. And typically, like I said, three years and out with 10 years kind of being the limit of where I would tell you to go on the yield curve. And, and up until six months ago, we would never say go that far on a yield curve. But I think we all have an instinctual um, feel right now that rates will go down. So if you want to lock in some good paper at good rates long term, um, you can do that with MIGAs. But we love MIGAs. If you go to my site, there's a live feed. You put in your state, then you put in the duration you're looking at, and you can change those durations and look. And we list them from top to bottom of yield down. So the top yield on down, and then you'll see the ratings, and then you you can look at what ratings that you feel comfortable with. With MIGAs, I don't have an A plus or better feel just because I say we're dating that company. Remember, with lifetime income products, we're marrying that company for life. With these products, we're dating them. We might date them for three years. So we might recommend a B double plus company for three years. We might recommend an A minus company for five years after looking under the hood and saying, yeah, they can back up the claim for five years. I feel comfortable with that. But that's the way that we look at MIGAs. We're dating those people and 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 we're we ladder them. We we can do three, five, seven, ten year ladders, you know, just so that money's coming due. Just like you'd ladder a bond portfolio or ladder CDs, you can ladder MIGAs as well, split it amongst carriers, et cetera. But uh, I think that is a product that the annuity industry should promote. And the reason that they don't, if you're on this call and you're saying, wait a minute, Stan, I've never heard of a MIGA, what the multi-year guarantee annuity. It's because the built-in commissions 
formigas are minuscule. And let's let's stop for a second. All annuities commissions are built in. Now, here's a good way to look at it. The longer the duration, the higher the commission. The more complex the product, the higher the commission. But I always tell people, if you can't explain it to a nine-year-old, you shouldn't be buying it anyway. No offense to nine-year-olds. If you don't understand it, don't buy it. And, you know, Paul's been preaching that for 30 years. So, so let me make sure I understand this. I could take a MIGA for five years and I don't have to touch this, leave the interest in there to compound. Mm -hmm. Then at five years, I could take it all out and I'd have a big tax bill or the next year, let's say I, for some reason, I'm going to have a lower tax rate. I could roll it over into mm -hmm. a one year MIGA. Yeah, or, sure. I mean, they're, they are available at one, two, three. Yeah. And, one, two, and three. And let's up. talk so, about that. When you get to the end of the duration, let's just say you use this, we'll be in touch with you 90 days prior to the maturity and say, hey, what do you want to do? Here's your decision. So you can say, hey, Stan, send me the money. Great. You're going to pay taxes on the interest earned. Or you can say, let's roll it to another MIGA. If it's IRA, it's an IRA to IRA transfer, non-taxable event. If it's non-IRA, it falls under the 1035 IRS non-taxable event transfer. You can keep kicking the tax puck down the ice. Or you can get, in Paul's example, you can get to that five-year time period and say, you know what, Stan? This MIGA has been good, but I need lifetime income. Let's transfer the MIGA 1035 exchange to the highest paying immediate annuity at that time. Mm -hmm. And we'll and it will transfer there. So again, we'll get to that five-year time period and ask you those two questions again. What do you want the money to contractually do? And when do you want those contractual guarantees to start? A lot of people do what I call MIGA to SPIA, which is a very efficient way to get lifetime income and never pay any fees ever. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's a very pro-consumer way. And I've done a lot of videos on on the MIGA to SPIA type thought. So, so talk to us about the the the, the difficulty of of changing from let's say a five year uh, a MIGA with one insurance company, but there's a better rate with another insurance company, or what mm -hmm. I have would I have to stay with the same insurance company? No. And, no. and if that's the case, do you help the clients make that transfer? We do. Let's let me let me explain how that works. First of all, I want to be very clear on this. When you get to when you let's just say you purchased a MIGA, you get to the end of the duration, what whatever duration you bought, there's not a triggering effect. It's not going to turn into an income stream. It's a it's a CD. So you have mm -hmm. a decision. Do you want the money back? Do you want to roll it to another one? My team that's in the Vegas office, which is kind of the administrative office, they do all the paperwork. They would do all of that for you and make sure all of that's done, obviously, with your approval. We send you the paperwork to sign and review, et cetera. But, but we handle all of that. Then we work directly with the carriers to make sure that that uh, transfer is a non-taxable event. One thing about transferring annuities, whether you are transferring it from MIGA to MIGA or MIGA to SPIA, we have to prove to the annuity company that's receiving the money that you're getting, you the consumer are getting a better contractual deal, moving mm -hmm. the moving the, the to another annuity company. Okay, mm -hmm. a lot of people out there, unfortunately, are telling people to move because of upfront bonuses and things like that. That is that's called twisting and churning. That we do not do. We have to show side by side in a on, within the the application why you're moving mathematically. And the mm -hmm. receiving annuity company has to sign off on that. So there's some really good things in place. The annuity industry has, you know, it gets a bad rap because of the sales practices out there, but we're trying to clean that up. One thing you have to understand about annuities that I like, it's the only financial type product that has what's called a free look time period. In other words, mm -hmm. you can buy an annuity and you can get the policy. The policy is in force. And for, you don't even have to have a reason, you can get your money back. Each state has a different time period. Typically right now, it's a 20 to 30 days from the time you receive the policy. You can free look and not, you don't have to give a reason. You say, I just want my money back and they'll send it. I love that because a lot of people get high pressured out there. They don't know what they bought. You can get your money back. You don't have to get your agent involved. You just call the carrier and say, give me my money back. But we love that because things change. Sometimes people buy it and something in their life changes between the time they bought it and the time the policy is delivered. And by the way, it, typically at this point in time, it's taken anywhere from 15 to say 20 days from start to finish 
right now at the time of this statement because we track it to go from I want the policy to policy in your hand. Yeah, I think most of them pay out start paying after a month. Is is that common? Well, from from a well, it depends on when you want the income to start. You know, if you want it to start within thirty days, it's thirty days. That's the soonest lifetime income will start. But a lot of people, like I said in, in a previous comment, they'll ladder income. They'll say, okay, Stan, I want it to start 30 days, one to start in 30 days, one to start in one year, three years, five years. So they have income coming in to, you know, not just combat inflation, but but to, you know, live your life. I always say to people, there's three phases of retirement, go-go, slow-go, and no-go. And we yeah. want you to enjoy go-go, you know, because once you get the slow-go and no-go, you're not enjoying your money. And yeah. one of the things that we try to, to talk to our clients about his lifestyle and living that lifestyle from a contractually guaranteed standpoint. I love the markets, but these are not market products, even though there's a lot out there. If we want to pivot to that, that's how a lot of them are sold with market type attachments and hopes and dreams. So tell me more about this uh, idea that the, uh, the returns, is it the MIGA, the returns are, are, are better uh, than the indexed, annuities there's been some studies that have shown that the the MIGA returns historically have outperformed index annuities index annuities and i have nothing against them uh we we use index annuities not for the accumulation we use them if you need income five years down the road seven years down the road it's something that you can attach called an income rider on my site you can quote income riders but that's an attachment we use with index annuities because it's just an efficient delivery system but index annuities were put on the planet in 1995. I was around back then um, by a company called Keyport Life. And they were the first ones to come out with it. And it was, they were designed to compete with CD returns. And that's exactly what they do. Um, they are not market products. They are not a security. They're a fixed annuity regulated at the state level, but they're sold with the premise of market upside with no downside or market participation with, you know, with principal protection. You know, that sounds that sounds great, but it's you know, that's a sales pitch. OK, nobody can give you that market returns. And what they'll do is they'll show you back tested numbers, which I'm trying to limit within the carriers. I don't think we should be showing the back tested numbers because you can cherry pick those. And also with index annuities, with a lot of these, most of these companies, they can change the rules on how the gains are calculated. So let me give you an example. You buy a ten, most of these chassis you'll see is a seven or 10 year index annuity. So you buy, let's just say you buy a seven-year index annuity. Most of these companies, in essence, you're buying a one-year index annuity, and they get to change the rules at their discretion on how those gains, cap spreads, and participation rates um, are calculated the rest of the time. I'd rather you follow Paul's mutual fund thing. I mean, if you're wanting market growth, then buy market growth stuff. This is, it, to me... The contractual guarantees of an index annuity is the one percent guarantee. Okay, that's if you're going to do that, then then buy migas, which leads us to variable annuities, which we don't sell because we don't sell anything that has the potential to go down. And variable annuities are nothing more than than mutual funds. The industry calls them separate accounts, but mutual funds with a, an average annual fee of around three percent for the life of the policy. My yes. question to you, and nothing against the the variable annuity people is why wouldn't you follow Paul's um, advice and just buy mutual funds? Yeah. You know, that's just my opinion and, and well, not pay love, the 3% fee. We love the word guaranteed. You know, we'll <laughs> give up a lot for the world word uh, a guarantee, a guaranteed. So yeah. you talked about two major kinds of annuities and each one of those has a number of ways that you can access and use them. Uh, and you're talking about, ab about doing this from a base of products that are, uh, do you follow a hundred companies? I have no idea. More, the more than that. Yeah. We track, we track, we track more than that and use, um, use a lot of companies that do that for us. And so that we look at underneath from a financial standpoint, we look at the products from what they're offering, but it's, it's, I've made it very, very simple because I'm only looking at the contractual guarantees. So if, you know, I'm not looking at an index annuity for potential growth, the word potential doesn't exist in within my company, it's all contractual. So we're looking at the income rider guarantee attached to that index annuity. 
Index annuities and variable annuities, you can attach what's called an income rider for future income. It's a separate calculation that you know it's a monopoly money that you can only use for income, but it's contractual. That's the contractual part. And historically, income riders attached to fixed annuities pay out more than um, income riders attached to variable annuities. Maybe there's some, that might be some exceptions. And yeah. I'm not against variable annuities. I love the no load variable annuity that has 100% liquidity out there. And there used to be some really good products, but they're kind of gone now. The problem with, in my opinion, with variable annuities is you're limited with your mutual fund choices based on what the carrier allows you to choose. Once again, if you're doing market growth, if market growth is the goal, don't buy an annuity. If market growth is a goal, you should have no limitations with choices and the upside. So anything you see with annuities that someone pitches market growth or potential growth or market participation, there's a limitation, whether it's a choice or a limitation on that upside, period. Yeah. Yeah. So I looked at um, a number of, of quotes on your site today, mm -hmm. and I noticed that some of the biggest companies, and I'm not going to mention names because yeah. I think you're yeah. sensitive please, about that, yeah. but best known companies are not making very, the, the payments they're making don't seem to be very competitive. And on top of that, one company uh, under one kind of product mm -hmm. has about five different offerings. And I'm guessing that those are five different commission structures. Typically, it's five different distributions of uh, channels. They, they'll have five different products for different distribution channels. We just typically get them all. Um, if it's the but same every, product... But but Stan, in every case, it was a different payout. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 which made it sound like why was the the payout different for the for a product that was quoted that was a, a, a commodity product? It could be that, Paul. It could be that, but in most cases, it's not. But I'm not saying it, it's a, a lot of the time yeah. it it is. Once again, going back to the companies, a lot of the bigger companies, the names that you know within the last. Uh, since October of 22, when the fixed rate went at 5%, ever since then, these big companies have been inundated, as you can only imagine, with premium coming in. So a lot of them are at capacity for now, and they don't need the money to come in. So their, their quotes aren't as low. But I always tell people, give them a month. They're going to need money. You know, people are going to die off. They're going to have to fill the tranches, et cetera. Um, and that's the reason it's important to quote all carriers and the and the career agent that only work for one company, I think that model's kind of dead because because the commoditization of these products and the fact that baby boomers are looking for contractual guarantees, especially for their income floor and their principal protection products. And you also made the comment on your site that the most that insurance folks are supposed to to put these kind of products that we're talking about here tonight mm -hmm. is 50% of a, of a portfolio. Investable and, assets. That does not include your house, car, or collectible guitars. You know, it's just investable assets. The National Association of Insurance Commissioners frown upon people putting more than 50% of their investable assets in annuities. That doesn't mean you have to put it all there. That's the reason yeah. we like using the reverse engineer quote system because you use as little amount of money as humanly possible. If you say, Stan, I really, can we do 55% or 57? I'm going to have to make a phone call and and pound the table for, for and I'm not guaranteed that they're going to approve it. But if you say, Stan, I just like my guys, I want to buy 100%, it's not going to happen. And the only way that it could happen is if is if an agent, which we would never do, would fraudulently fill out the application, which is a oh. felony. That is a felony. It's like wow. filling out a mortgage application um, and, and, and doctoring it. So if you think about 50 percent of your investable assets in annuities, I think that to me, you know, in, in the automobile world, you call that putting the governor on the on the gas you know, it's it's a good governor. I don't know how many people follow it out there. And I don't, you know, there's some carriers that might turn their head and take more, but we're pretty, we're pretty strict with that because I've been on the other side of the table in the investment world. You need, the majority of what you have does not need to be in annuities and you might not need annuities at all. If you don't need lifetime income or you don't need to protect the principal, you feel comfortable with AAA, AAA munis or treasuries or CDs or whatever you're doing, 
that's fine. If you've already got long-term care figured out, that's fine. If you got life insurance, then you probably don't need an annuity. Now, for all you people that might be saying that, I want you to think about your spouse because my I'm thinking about mine now, 35 years. She, you know, I don't, you know, I she doesn't know anything about you know the business, but I have things set up for her so that things kick in for her lifetime income. And let's talk about that real quick. If you're thinking out there, how do I buy something for my spouse, but I don't need to buy it now? What I would tell you to do is talk to your trust lawyer and say, let's put something in the trust that says, upon my passing, let's buy an immediate annuity for my spouse to solve for this specific goal. That alleviates you having to buy some product now, trying to guess when you're going to pass away. That's what I tell people. You can set things up. And I have two daughters, 27 and 25. There's things in the trust that's going to trigger when they hit certain ages. We're going to buy an immediate annuity, not knowing if Social Security is going to be there. You know, we do those type of, of planning for families so that, you know, the kids I always say, my kids are going to show up at my funeral in a Lamborghini. I just want them making payments on it, right? I don't want them <laughs> to be buying it with cash. So we can lovingly handcuff and contractually handcuff your beneficiaries to create income streams for them. So, so that that would be a good product uh, and and a will for a child that has uh, no discipline around money and Bingo. would in fact give them protection for life, which again is the pension that everybody would like to have. And it's and, the pension that only nine percent of companies now offer. Is probably going to be by the time our kids get there, it'll be five. So I'm going to set a pension up for them, and maybe that's something that you might want to do for your grandkids or your uh, or your kids. But to, you know, be careful from the standpoint of, of buying packaged products. I always tell people, you really shouldn't even be looking at annuities unless you're 50 years or older. And 50 is very young, okay? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. at 50, you should at least start learning about them. But for 20s and 30s and 40s, they need to be in the markets. They need growth. They can afford ups and downs. And Paul, Paul's would be the one that I would tell you to go to. You shouldn't be buying for them then. There's extenuating circumstances and that we have to set up income streams for for kids at younger ages but you know those are those are one offs and we can help with that so stan we're almost at the at the time that we were going to have our conversation and we're going to open this up to questions but yeah. i just want to make sure we we focused on the miga we focused on the uh, single premium immediate annuity mm -hmm. and and uh and what is the other most used kind of annuity? Deferred income annuities, um, deferred income annuities, QLACs, and then income riders that are attached to indexed annuities. Those are all lifetime income products. Once again, they're, they're, all of those calculators are on my site that you can run quotes for. But, one, but again, if your time horizon, I'll just go through the time horizons. If your time horizon to start income is 30 days up to a year, that's an immediate annuity. Anything past that, deferred income annuity, a qualified longevity annuity contract and income riders, you just kind of have to run the quotes and see who comes out the best. Also, it comes down to uh, what type of account you're going to use. Obviously, qualified longevity annuity contracts uh, are used in IRA assets, and and you don't that that amount of money used in a, in a QLAC is not part of your RMD calculations. So there can be some positives with that. But I wanted to before we got to the um, questions, I kind of want to go over the pros. Let's do the pros and cons real quick. Um, on Good. annuities, the, the pros to me is that they're contractual. You can make a decision. You should make your decision on the contractual guarantee, what they will do, not what they might do. Remember that you're transferring the risk. And for lifetime income, don't look at don't look for ROI. It's no ROI until you die. It's going to pay as long as you're breathing. And because we're only looking at contractual guarantees, you can then shop all carriers. You've created a commodity type product. You can shop all carriers for the highest contractual guarantee for your specific situation and how you want to customize it, knowing that those quotes change like a gallon of milk. Now, the negatives and the cons of the annuity industry are pretty basic, and, and you probably will know, you're, you're going to probably be wording them with me. The sales pitches out there are horrific. Mm -hmm. um, you know, If it sounds too good to be true, it is every single time with, with annuities, no exceptions. All the stuff with upfront bonuses and market upside with no downside, those are people trying to sell index annuities, and I have nothing against index annuities, but that's just the wrong way to sell them. They're CD products that if you want to buy for the contractual guarantee and principal protection, that's fantastic. You know, if you're getting pitched something and you don't feel comfortable about with it, write down what you've been pitched, 
sign and date it, have the person sign and date that sales pitch to protect yourself. That pen will weigh a thousand pounds if they're not, if not telling the truth. Um, <laughs> but just remember also the 50% of your portfolio is a maximum, but you should always try to use the least amount of money possible to solve for the contractual goals that you need, whether that's principal protection, income for life, legacy, and long-term care. The annuity industry, I'll close with this and then we'll get to the questions. The annuity industry has earned its bad reputation. We can all agree with that. There's some really bad things going out there. The, the bad chicken dinner seminars that's turned into very expensive steak dinner seminars. All I can tell you is go swallow the poo, don't swallow the pitch. My mom lives in Florida. She's 84 years old. She goes to four a week and I appreciate all those agents that are feeding her. But, you know, take advantage of it. You're not going to learn much. It'll be fun. You know, if you have hearing aids, take them out. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, the, the industry is cleaning itself up. Uh, and we are, uh, I think, a leader in that from the standpoint of just um, selling in the right way, which is the contractual guarantees. The other thing, too, there's never an urgency to buy an annuity. You're buying a contract. There's yeah. never, hey, you need to buy it. You need to sign it. You need none. You buy it when you think the contractual guarantees are fair for your situation and 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 you want to lock them in. It's really that simple. So, so Stan, I've got two more quick questions before yeah. we let it loose here. <laughs> One is you have a service where you give a second opinion. Yes. I, I would really like to understand that because it sounds it it sounds like it would be valuable to a lot of people uh who have bought a sales pitch they believe mm -hmm. and i've never sat through one of your second opinions so i don't know what you do what do you do well you know they're all different um obviously if you've if you've held if you bought it and you held it past the free look time period you own it okay so a mm -hmm. lot of times we're going to try to tell you how to make lemonade if you, we think you bought a lemon we'll tell you, try to we'll tell you how to maximize that that policy if we think that we can move you to something contractually better, then we'll look at that. But in most cases, we're just advising people on what they actually own, not what the sales pitch was, and how to utilize it better or the best way. That's typically the second opinions. The second opinions that we get during the sales process, like they went to the Bad Chicken Dinner Seminar, this guy pitched this stand, what do you think? Then we really can help you decipher, okay, this is what he pitched or she pitched, and then we'll come back and say, what are you trying to solve for? The other thing too is, anytime you're looking at annuities, you should look at three to five to seven carriers. I mean, you have a goal. If someone's saying this is the best one, that means it's the best one for them. Um, you hmm. should be getting multiple quotes from multiple carriers because there's hundreds and hundreds of them out there that offer the same type of product. So again, they're commodity products, they're not one size fits all, and there's not one carrier that's better than the other. So one, the last question then is, if I look at your list of of uh, uh, the, the the annuities and their mm -hmm. monthly payout, and I like the one on top, mm -hmm. but I, I want to do business with my local insurance agent. Okay. Is it that easy? Well, we'd rather you do it with us, but if you have a brother-in-law that if you have a brother-in-law that you got to work with, yes, we will help with that. If they if they have that access to that carrier, then they can lock in that quote, and then you know we'll like if you going back to the original question, if you like the quote, we'll lock in the quote, and then start the the application paperwork with that quote being locked in. Um, so you know we do that, but if you have someone that you've been working with that really doesn't understand annuities and they have access to XYZ company, just like we do an XYZ company finished at top, then yeah, yep. you can take that quote that you got from us because it's emailed to you and you can walk in and say, hey, you know, I got this from Stan the Annuity Man, I wanna work with you and I need to lock this in. What we find though is a lot of these, the people that manage money don't have access to a lot of the ones that we have. That's if they what do, I would... If they do, that's great. I mean, our whole thing is we want you to get the best quote. If it's us, great. If you get it from the guy you've been working with for 25 years or gal, that's great too. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. Yep. Stan, thank you. Jim, are you there, man? Are we, yeah. Have we got some good questions boiling? 
So uh, we do, you know, we have a lot of bright people clearly who know what they're talking about. So I'm actually, I'm going to ask Stan to give a quick perusal of those questions. Of those I'm, look, I'm looking questions. for them. Where would I find them? Um, so flip, click on the Q and a down in the, in the ribbon at the bottom. Oh, I see them. I got you. Okay. So we've got some good questions. Some of them are very specific. And so um, let's just go. Can we just go down the, down the, I'll just take a one at a time quickly. Yeah, that's great. Okay, great. this is David, and his con his question is: There data on the percentage of insurance companies that become insolvent? Is it wise to split up? the The first question I would go to the National Association of Insurance Commissioners (NAIC), or you could go to your state guarantee fund again (NOLHGA), and they typically have a listing of that. But we, um, you know, to get on our board, to get in for us to recommend you, we've looked under the hood, and with my background, I can tell. As I always say, when the son-in-law is buying the bonds for dad, you know, I can tell when there's some mistakes being made. So we we do a good job uh, looking at that, but it's it's going to be lower than you think. Is it wise to split up annuity contracts between mul multiple insurance companies? In my opinion, if if the guarantees are kind of the same with three good companies at the same ratings, then why not? Right? I wouldn't split it up and then take a haircut on a guarantee, but if the guarantees are in line with all three, I would I would split it. Yeah, definitely. Um, here's a question from Ricky. Are there times that fixed variable or index linked annuities are the most optional, uh, optimal solution for retirement problem? It, Ricky, I'm gonna answer this from the stand the annuity man lens. I don't do potential. I don't do market returns. If you do market returns and the ones that you talked about, variable or index linked, which are called buffer annuities or RILAs, these are all potential products with non-guaranteed return scenarios. I think you're better off doing market products. In my opinion, I don't think they're designed to screw people, but they're so complex, Ricky, that again, I always tell people, if you can't explain it to a nine-year-old, don't buy it. And some of these pro products are very, very complex. With us, you're going to buy contractual guarantees. So, And if you're looking for, when you mentioned variable or index link annuities, those are market products. And I would, I would do, I would just do non-annuities. Are you familiar with RISA with Wei Fowl? Yeah, Wei Fowl has been on my. I have a, I have a podcast called, and Paul's been on it. It's called Fun with Annuities. I am familiar with the RISA boxes that uh, Wade has um, developed in that matrix. I do like that. I do like what he's talking about. Wade and I disagree on indexed annuities. Um, you know, because he knows that I'm, I don't buy. He, he's okay with potential. And Wade's smart, you know. Wade and Paul are on the uh, Mount Rushmore of financial advisors, but um, yeah, I I love Wade and I do like the Risa thing he came up with. And what he's talking about, Wade just came. If, if you pull up Wade Fowl on Amazon, he's got a book that explains those style boxes that are really really good. Anonymous. At some point, can you talk about the safety of spias and protections in the event of the insurance company having troubles? Paul and I did cover that with the state guarantee funds, but once again. I think with C SPIA, single premium immediate annuities, those, um, if you're A plus or better, you're good. And there's really, there's there's no history of A plus or better being in, being in trouble. A plus or better for lifetime income because you're marrying that company. Difference between a MIGA and a CD ladder, there really is no difference um, other than the account type. If you're using non-qualified money, the MIGA ladder can grow and compound tax deferred. Um, as I told Paul, I have a, a a little kind of a hack that if your duration that you want to lock in is less than three years, buy CDs. If it's more than three years, my guess. So if you said, Stan, I want to do a you know six month, twelve month, eighteen month, twenty four month, um, three year, five year, seven year, the first four would be CDs because it's less than three years, and then we'd lock in higher guarantees with the MIGAs. Is inflation protection an option from anonymous? Um, Companies will offer that, but once again, they don't give it away. From a lifetime income standpoint, anytime you're looking at a either whether it's a potential increase in income for inflation or a contractual, you know, cost of living adjustment, all the annuity company does is simply lower that initial payment by 30 to 40 percent. In my opinion, it's not mathematically worth it. It feels good, but you already own the best inflation annuity on the planet, and that's called Social Security. Uh, thoughts on index annuities from Daniel. I, I have nothing against them. They're CD products. They return CD returns. Um, I don't like the fact that with most of them, the annuity companies can change the rules at their discretion on how the indexes 
can be calculated for the gains. So the way that we use them is a when you go to our site and run income rider quotes, those are attached to index annuities. We just use them as a delivery system. What type of annuities qualify as a QLAC? QLAC stands for Qualified Longevity Annuity Contract. It's it was it's the the newest annuity that was put out and developed by the Treasury Department and um, the IRS, both of them, um, so that people can use their IRA money for lifetime income in combination with Social Security. It can only be used in you know IRAs, 457s, 403bs. Some 401ks are starting to offer it, but in essence, it's a deferred income annuity, which is a, an immediate annuity. It's a lifetime income stream that with a QLAC, you can defer it as far out as age 85. And you know I've written a book on QLACs and done a lot on this, so you can dig in if you want to. But the amount of money that you can put in a QLAC um, is not used to calculate your required minimum distribution. So you can lower your potentially lower your taxes on your RMDs and set up a lifetime income and add your spouse for lifetime income using your IRA money. So I like that. Daniel, what are Stan's thoughts on selling a 15-year index annuity to an 80-year-old person should lose their license straight up? Um, my opinion, uh, that is a unsuitable recommendation, period, end of story. Um, and that's that's insane. And that right there, and yet, yes, index annuity is a life insurance product, but that right there is why the annuity industry gets a bad reputation. Because all that agent's doing is trying to get a um, a commission. Because index annuities and variable annuities have high commissions because their surrender charge periods are long and they're complex. That mean they're bad, but that's just reality. That's a horrific recommendation. Is it true that annuity has extra cost to make it tax deferred? That is not true. Uh, there is no extra cost. Once again, Ricky, when you're buying a, a, an annuity, you can put it in a non-IRA, IRA, Roth IRA. The contractual guarantees are the same. They don't ratchet it up or down for the specific type of, of uh, account you're using. Bob, does Stan say he doesn't recommend inflation riders? Uh, at this point, Bob, we do not. They used to have what's called a CPIU um, attachment, but they, there's no more of those. Now the only thing that you can buy is a COLA, cost of living adjustment is what that stands for, attached to a, a SPIA, DIA, or QLAC. We don't recommend it once again because the annuity company just ratchets down that payment. Um, if you said, Stan, I want to buy three, four SPIAs and one of them with a COLA, then I'm listening. But mathematically, when you run the math numbers, the break-even point doesn't make sense. For the index annuity, people out there selling an index annuity that say says that you know the, it increases with the index uh, growth, Once the, the annuity company is not giving that away. They're lowering the payment by 30 to 40% in most cases. So in my opinion, mathematically, I'm a math guy. It doesn't make sense. I'd rather you, as I mentioned earlier in the in the program, when you need to fill a gap, run a reverse engineer quote for that specific dollar amount. Okay. Um, another question: Can you get any type of MIGA SPIA within an IRA? Yes, you can. Um, all of those products can be used in IRAs, Roth IRAs. QLACs are the only ones that can only be used in an IRA. Q stands for qualified. So it's it's the only annuity that has a limitation on account type, and that's IRA. And once again, that's because the IRS and the Department of the Treasury wants all of you people with all of those big IRAs to um, buy QLAX for lifetime income. MIGA to SPIA, can you explain the latter? Yes, MIGA to SPIA is like, let's just say you bought a MIGA, which is the annuity industry version of a CD. You bought, in Paul's example, you bought a five-year MIGA, at the end of the five year, instead of cashing it in or rolling it to another MIGA, we would then transfer it to an immediate annuity for lifetime income payment. So you go from principal protection as the goal to lifetime income as the goal. And again, we would verify that goal. How do DIA and FIA and income rider, um, how do they compare? Um, there are some good and bad with income riders. Income riders are a little bit more flexible from the standpoint of you can decide you're not going to do that. And there's some liquidity there. Whereas with a deferred income annuity, DIA is what that stands for. That is a lock and load type product and annuitized type product. So one of the things we'd ask you, you know, again, what do you want the money to contractually do when you want those contractual guarantees to start? If you said, I need income in seven years, we quote the DIA, we quote the indexed annuity with an income rider, looking at only the income rider guarantee. And then we would explain the good and the bad, because not one's better than the other. It all comes down to your situation. 
Um, next question, other than the differences in state guarantee funds, are there differences between on which state you live in? Yes. Um, so let's just say the, this, the latter part of the question, what if you buy the annuity and later move to another state? Is there anything particular to annuities that you should be aware of? Um, let's just say you bought an annuity in, in the state of Washington. You're, you're covered at that point in time by the state of Washington Guarantee Fund, but you then move to Florida. Then the annuity contractual guarantee doesn't change, but the state guarantee of Florida will then cover your annuity. Okay, so it, it comes down to the residency. Stan, how do you make your money? Um, I If you remember, all all annuities have built-in commissions that you don't see. MIGAS, SPIAs, DIAs, QLACs, INDEX, whatever. And they're, they're built in and hidden from the consumer. I don't like that. We'll be very transparent if you want to see what we make. But um, that's how I make my money. It's, it's, it's commission. We don't charge a flat fee, but it's built in and you never see it. So we try to negotiate those commissions uh, down to make us more competitive if they will allow us to do that. Um, and like I said, we're licensed in all 50 states, so we do a, a lot of volume. But that's how I make my money, truly. Um, and YouTube stuff, you know, YouTube commissions, right? <laughs> <laughs> were there any times when a state guarantee fund was ever tapped? <clears throat> yeah, 2008, um, when that debacle happened, we had one company that was absorbed by the state guarantee fund and then and then immediately uh, purchased by a larger company so we have seen that happen, but but to answer your question in a more broad standpoint, Ricky, state guarantee funds have never been tested. I I would I would I'll look at that two ways. Number one, good for the annuity industry, but number two, that worries me a little bit less by quality. Does that make sense? You know, we I can't point to a time where all heck broke loose and all the state guarantee funds did this because we haven't really had all heck break loose. Um, and a lot of that's because these fixed annuity companies are handcuffed not to do anything stupid. And once again, they have to have 100% of your money on hand day one. So, you know, we just haven't seen that. But but um, to answer your question, do residents of a state get better rates? No, no. These The state, it's it's overseen by the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, NAIC.com, and they do a great job. So it's not it's not the wild, wild west you think it is. How has the Secure Act 2.0 pushing back on RMD age affected the QLAC market? It really hasn't affected it negatively because when the QLACs first came out in 2014, you could only put $125,000 in it. Now the limit's up to $200,000 per. So what they've done is as they push the back the RMD, they've raised the, the limit on QLACs. And again, with QLACs, right now at the time of this taping, please look at the date because it will change. You put $200,000 in and you go to take your... RMDs, that $200,000 is not part of the uh, calculations for your required minimum distribution. So you could save a little bit of money on taxes, but I will say this, do not buy QLACs for tax savings. Buy QLACs for lifetime income for you or lifetime income for you and a spouse. The tax savings should be the third reason you do it, okay? If a state guarantee fund only covers 250, how does that math work for new to already paying lifetime income payments? Let's just say you bought a two hundred fifty thousand dollar immediate annuity and it's in payment form. Those you're covered. Period. You're, you're annuitized and covered. Um, but once again, I don't have many examples. I've only got one, and it lasted a couple of months. So with the the two thousand eight situation, um, my opinion, the annuity industry is going to back that up because the last thing they want is someone like my mom on national television saying she didn't get her payment because that would be horrific. And she would do that. So uh, thoughts on delaying Social Security to effectively buy additional level of inflation adjusted? You know, Paul's a, probably a better one to answer that. But I don't, um, I just think there's a time value money calculation of, you know, should you take it at 65 or 70? Obviously, 70 is going to be better. But if you need it at 65 and you then factor in the five, if you're going to wait till 70, factor in the five years of, of payments that you missed, Um I think it's just a case by case basis. One thing I can tell you is with annuities, you can't time it and the bell doesn't ring at the top or the bottom. You know, I would I would encourage you to just uh, I'm different from most advisors. I want you to live your life and put in the income floor sooner than later. Um, how long would it take to get a MIGA via 1035 from an existing fidelity annuity? Probably around 20 days. Um, does it make a difference for New York resident? No. Um, you know, New York is 
they're tough to work with, but that's fine. I mean, we we have a zillion New York clients, so in all 50 states we have clients. Does each insurance, insurance company have different windows of time? No, uh, they don't. It really comes down to how busy they are and the capacity they're at. Um, we do have kind of a red phone into most of these companies because of who we are, so we go pretty quickly and have a great staff that this is all they do. They do paperwork, they talk with these carriers, and they get it done. Um, how can we use annuity for long-term care? Great, great question. Long-term care annuities is actually a health insurance product, not a life insurance product. Um, if you really want to look at that, there's different types. There's a, a simplified issue, which means you have to answer questions over the phone. Um, there's a guaranteed issue product attached to uh, with an income rider for long-term care, confinement care. Um, but what I'm going to tell you is never, ever cash in traditional long-term care to buy an annuity. An annuity for long-term care should be in addition to what you currently have. If you don't have anything, then I would encourage you to exhaust traditional long-term care. And there's different types. There's asset-based long-term care attached to either life insurance or annuities or whatever that's really good. And see if you qualify for that. If you don't qualify for that, then we should be your last resort for long-term care because there are guaranteed issue products. But just think logically about it. If it's underwritten, it's probably going to be better for you. And that's the case for long-term care. Uh, John asks, wife and I are in our mid-70s. Does it make sense to replace cash in a money market fund with immediate fixed annuity? Um, I'm a big fan of cash. I always think it's good to have cash, and especially these money market rates that you're getting, that's good. I think the question you have to answer is, do you and your wife want to set up a lifetime income stream that will pay you as long as each of you is breathing? And if you pass away, continues uninterrupted and unchanged for her life, and we'd structure it so that if you passed away together, all the money would go to your family. The question is, do you want another pension or do you want to have full liquidity? Because when you talk about money market funds versus a, a immediate annuity, that's apples and oranges. You know, Immediate annuities is, is an income stream. It's a pension. Money market is purely liquid. Um, you know, As long as you're getting these good rates on money market, you know, I would probably tell you to stay in the money market. Once that starts going down, then you may can take a portion of that money market and, and put in place a lifetime income stream. What I would like for you to do is run the budget and say, okay, what's the gap, if any, that we need to fill? And then we fill that gap with the immediate annuity. Um, last question, it looks like, is the annuity industry getting cleaner? Yes, I'm trying. Uh, it's, it's, getting, it's getting better. Have you found predatory annuity companies that are going out of business? No. Or is it going the other way with bad players are getting written? No, they're not trying to screw. I mean, and I, I need to address that. You know, companies that are putting products out, they're not trying to, they're not trying to screw you. What happens is the the army, the agent army out there cannot be monitored of what they say. Now, I think that can be done away with with my model, which is a direct-to-consumer contractual guarantee, because it is what it is. It's never going to change. You're buying the contractual guarantee. But there's not annuity companies that are bad players. Um, they just have some some bad agents. But not all agents are bad either. Every sales industry has its bad group. But uh, there, there's not companies trying to screw you. They're trying to create products that they think will attract some of those I agree with, some of those I don't agree with. And again, we only look at contractual guarantees. And I think if you only look at contractual guarantees and and use annuities as the non-correlated, non-market assets that they should be, and then use people like Paul's service for growth, you're going to be in good shape because you're not going to meld the two. Don't ever meld the two. You know, they should be separate. Stan, I, I, I would like you to answer one question, mm -hmm. because this this gathering is about education, and one of the reasons that you are on our list of truth tellers is because you've had a commitment to education above and beyond anybody else I know, and you're part of the financial world. Appreciate that. So just take a second and go through, for the people that want to continue to learn, what they come to your site for in terms of education. Okay. First thing, and I think the, the cornerstone is I have a, and you can link from my site, the Stanley Nudie Man YouTube channel. Um, and then we also do a, a podcast with people like Paul uh, called Fun with Annuities. And those are educational. I've done over a thousand of those. Um, so you can watch those at your leisure. They're all pretty short in length. 
um, so it's easy to understand. I typically take one topic and factually, you know, factually give the facts of that. I've also written seven books on annuities. Um, and those books, you know, books on single premium immediate annuities, deferred income annuities, income riders, index annuities, QLAX, and those are all 50 to 60 page reads. Those are free. You can get them on my site. Um, you know, it's, it's easy to do. And then the other is, is using our calculators. You can run those quotes 24, seven, 365. There's no limitations. You can run them forever. There's a live MIGA feed to see the best rates. If you want to check rates, I would tell you to go to bankrate.com to check CD rates, money market rates, and then go to my site at theannuityman.com and check um, MIGA rates. If you're looking, okay, where, where's the fixed rate market that that'll give you a feel for what the fixed rate market's doing. But yeah, my, my, um, and then if you want to, if you want to book a call with our team, you can do that, but you don't have to do that. There's everything there is, is for you. If you need a second opinion on something that's being pitched to you or something that you own and really want to know what you have, we do that too. We're the only ones doing that in the industry. So, um, you know, I built the site for the consumer. It is not for agents. Um, every one of my team is licensed, but they're not agents. We're, we're people, you have to be licensed to talk about annuities. That's the reason they're licensed. But there's not junior stands and people running around being, you know, stand junior. It's it's me, it's my company, my wife and I own 100%. It's just grown more than we could have ever imagined. And I think it's really based upon, ironically, we're the we're unique in the industry. We just sell contractual guarantees. Everyone else is kind of selling the hopes and the dreams and the sizzle. I always say, buy the stake, not the sizzle when it comes to annuities. Stan, you're, you are unique, and we really appreciate you spending time with us uh, tonight. And I, I suspect that you're going to get lots more questions uh, from this group. And I want to thank all the folks that have come out next week. For people who want to attend my presentation, uh, I'll be talking about some of the most important investment decisions that we make and and uh, what, what are in your best interest. So uh, join us next week. And uh, and Jim, do you have any uh, any? Did you have anything left in your uh, question just, list of questions? Just my gratitude to uh, both you, Paul, and Stan. What a what a terrific presentation impressive uh question and answer at the end so thank you for uh for doing that and thanks everybody for joining us today enjoyed it thank you so much everyone have right. a good evening take care good night bye -bye. Now.